Hello everyone. My name is Momoka. I'm a international. I am a chair of International Week this year. On behalf of International Student Council and International Week, I would like you all to. I would like to come. I would like to welcome you all and then thank you for coming tonight. Hi, I want to remind you that tomorrow we are holding a closing ceremony of International Week. Uh, come and enjoy, try some international food, have fun with us. We are starting tomorrow at 7 p.m. I don't know when the fun is going to end, but try to reserve some time and come enjoy diversity. Hello. Welcome on behalf of the World Fair Series with funding by GSB for the panel discussion, U.S. Foreign Policy After the Midterm Discussions. I'm Bree McGriff and I'm on the Planning Committee. And before I introduce tonight's panel, I would like to encourage you to attend the next upcoming events. Um, a panel, How to Spend $50 Billion to Make the World a Better Place, November 13th at 7 p.m. in the Sun Room. Thomas Melville speaking on Witness to Terror in Central America and on Ron Hennessy on Monday, November 13th at 8 p.m. in the South Ballroom. There's Torture and the War on Terror, Jumana Musa of the Amnesty of Amnesty International, Tuesday, November 14th at 8 p.m. in the Campanile Room. And there's the expert on walking, Mark Benton, on walkable communities, Wednesday, Wednesday November 15th at 7 p.m. in the Oak Room. And lastly, there's Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women and Politics. ABC's Lynn Shear will be here Tuesday, November 28th at 7.30 p.m. in the South Ballroom. And now tonight's panel. Tonight we have Jim McCormick. He's the chair of the ISU Political Science Department, and he's also a professor. We have Richard Monsbach, who is a professor in the ISU Political Science Department. And we also have Diane Bystrom. She's the director of the Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics. And um, here they are. <laughs> well, thank you, Bree. Um, I'm the moderator for tonight's panel, and for those of you who know me, I do my work on American politics. So what am I doing on a, a panel on foreign policy? But uh, I agree to be the moderator tonight and to introduce our two speakers who do do um, their research and teaching on foreign policy. And so they'll have a lot to say about that in a few minutes. Um, it's really great to have this organized just uh, two days after the election. So this is a fresh analysis of the 2006 midterm elections, which we've all been kind of mulling over. I think uh, separately since that time. What uh, Pat Miller asked me to do is just to give a little um, opening about the election uh, and this will not be really about foreign policy. This is just going to tell you some just brief things about you know election highlights to kind of frame uh, the discussion that will occur in a few minutes. So just want to talk about a few things that you know I look at when uh, uh, from my perspective as uh, director of the Carrie Chapman Cat Center. Um, we always are concerned with voter turnout. One of the things that the Cat Center does is try to get youth and women engaged in the political process, really everybody, but our focus is on youth and women. And overall, the voter turnout was pretty good for a midterm election. It was uh, right now, we think, over 40%, which is, again, good for a mid-year. Uh, the interesting thing is that overall, Democrats uh, voted in more numbers than Republicans in the first time in 1990. And I'm sure that we'll be talking about that a little bit later as how that impact uh, might be on foreign policy. Um, the other thing I always like to talk about because reporters call me about the youth vote and in fact uh uh, one of my colleagues from the political science department and I uh, always disagree about the youth vote and so we were quoting the story the other day and I was very optimistic about the youth vote and my colleague was not and so I will say that youth did vote uh, in good numbers in the midterm elections. Uh, their voting percentage was 24% in 2006 and that's up from 20% in 2002. Again, lower than the overall average but uh, uh, good for youth. Um, and there were 10 million voters under the age of 30 who voted on November 7th, which was an increase of 2 million young voters. So there were 2 million more young voters who voted in 2006 than voted in the last midterm election uh, in 2002. Um, the other thing interesting about the youth vote, and again, that might have an impact obviously on the election, and in U.S. House races uh, nationwide, 61% of young voters voted for the Democratic candidate, which is the highest Democratic demographic percentage in any age group. 
So young voters were 61% likely to vote for a Democratic candidate in the U.S. House races. And so again, a large turnout for Democrats among youth. Uh, also, we get interested in issues, and I know going into the election, you heard that the war in Iraq was the top issue. And in fact, what we looked about with this campaign is that it was really a nationalized election and not so much a local one. There's a, a saying that, you know, Tip O'Neill said a long time ago that politics is local. But in this election, uh, national e issues seem to trump local ones. And so even in races like a governorship for the state, uh, national elections were, uh, national issues were important. But going into the election, all the polls were telling us that the top issue was the war in Iraq. Well, it was a top issue, but it was a little bit more complicated than that. CNN's polling showed that there were about five top issues, and you could identify more than one. So they asked voters what brought them to the poll. And these are all very close, and so, you know, statistically, they're probably not significantly different. But the top issue actually was corruption and ethics. And that ended up being the top issue with 41% of those in the CNN Exodus poll saying, that's why I showed up to the polls. The next one, next two at 39% were terrorism and the economy. So again, the economy is always, I think, a big election issue. 36% war in Iraq. So again, an, an election issue there. And then the last one was values, you know, that kind of nebulous values with 36%. Um, speaking of values, there were a lot of ballot initiatives this year that you probably read about, and that was kind of interesting because a lot of times these ballot initiatives are used to um, to motivate either a Democratic or Republican Party base, especially on issues like abortion and, and gay marriage. And so there was kind of a mixed result with that with some of these uh, ballot initiatives. You probably heard about the South Dakota ban on abortion that the legislature passed and the governor signed. It was on the ballot, a lot of national attention to that race. It was meant to be the bill that would go to the Supreme Court and perhaps overturn Roe v. Wade. That, fa that actually was overturned, and so the abortion ban in South Dakota was overturned by a vote of 55% to 45%. On the other hand, there were eight states that looked at a constitutional ban on gay marriage. And of those states, five approved a ban on gay marriage. And those states were Idaho, South Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and Wisconsin. And the vote's still not in from some of the other states. You also probably heard a lot about stem cell research. Uh, there was a big initiative on that in the state of Missouri. It actually got out both sides in that campaign. It was uh, actually was approved, but it was a vote of slightly over 50% to 49%. Minimum wage, another issue I think that will be going before Congress with the Democratic majority, uh, was approved in five states where they raised the minimum wage in states like Arizona, Missouri, Montana, uh, Nevada, and Ohio. Uh, big night for Democrats, you all know that. The tally is already in. The Senate is Democratic, 51 U.S. Senators are Democrats. That includes, includes Joe Lieberman, who ran as an independent but is counted as a Democrat, and 40 um, and 49 uh, Republicans. That was a gain of six uh, with the Senate. Uh, in the House, the current uh, count in the House is also Democratic. They gained um, 29 seats, 229 Democrats to 196 Republicans with 10 races still undecided. And then the other interesting thing is Democrats also gained six governorships where we have 28 Democratic governors and 21 Republicans. Iowa will have the first Democratic governor and Democratic legislature combination for the first time in 42 years. So this is the first time in 42 years that we've had a Democrat in executive office and also uh, controlling the legislature. I wouldn't be the chair or the director of the uh, Carrie Chapman Cat Center without saying a little bit about women, so I will end on talking about women in this election because I always look at that and then we'll turn it over to foreign policy. There were slight gains in representation among women across uh, Iowa and across the country. Uh, they're very incremental. Uh, progress is slow when it comes to women sometimes, but at least we're, those numbers are ticking upwards. We will have nine governors who are women uh, in the coming year. That ties a record set in 2004. Uh, all the incumbents were re-elected and then also a, a woman who will be a governor of Arkansas. Uh, this is the largest number of women, six that were ever elected in, a, in a, an election for governor and so that's a positive sign. 
U.S. Senate, we were at 14%. It will go to 16% with 16 women. Again, all incumbents were reelected. And two Democrats, one, uh, Amy Klosibar, who was running in uh, Minnesota in an open race, and then Clara McCaskill, who was a challenger in Missouri, won that race. And again, uh, I was interviewed by USA Today about that race, and, and stem cell research got a lot of attention. Malcolm J. Fox campaigning for her there. But really, I think what puts push Claire over the edge was actually the minimum wage initiative on that ballot, which passed by 75% to 25% and really uh, motivated the Democratic base there. We had 139 women running for the U.S. House. Uh, there's still some races that are undecided, but already uh, 67 races have been uh, decided in favor of women, so there will be 67 women in the U.S. House. Again, that's up, uh, or that's tied with the current percentage, but we think we'll pick up a few more races. Iowa, we are going to have the most women in Iowa ever in the legislature. There's 34, the old record was 33. Uh, that was set in 2001, so we'll have 34 women in the Iowa legislature. That will be about 22.7%, which is slightly still below the national average of currently 22.8, which will probably go up after the election. And finally, and probably most significantly, we will have the first woman speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives and Nancy Pelosi, who will have a big impact, I think, on Congress and foreign policy. So uh, with that noted, uh, Jim McCormick is going to talk about foreign foreign policy from a congressional perspective, and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Monsbach, and then we would like your questions and uh, hopefully have an interactive session. So thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, yes, I was given the assignment to talk about foreign policy from the congressional perspective, so I was uh, trying to figure out how, the, how best to approach this in, in my allotted 10 minutes. But let me just share a couple things with you. Um, first of all, if I could just expand one thing about uh, what Diane said with regard to the um, nationalizing of this election and the foreign policizing of this election. It's sort of instructive that, that uh, some of these exit polls, the, the best predictors of people's vote was their attitude on the war uh, and their approval of uh, President Bush. Uh, and th these things are obviously correlated with one another as well. Uh, but those things trumped, uh, even though the economy, for those that mentioned the economy, they trumped, uh, trumped the economy. And even when you control for these things um, in terms of the economy and their attitudes on the war, uh, you know, in sort of political science terms, the, the, the uh, uh, war variable turned out to be the, to be the better predictor here uh, of, uh, of voting attitudes. Why this is significant, um, it's, it seems to me, is that if you want a really an indicator of the nationalizing of elections, particularly with the economic variable, is that uh, usually uh, in congressional elections, uh, or at least typically, I should say, uh, the economic variable is the big predictor of, uh, of voting results. And so this is one way to get a handle on how this election has been nationalized. Um, I've read a couple things that have, uh, in, after the election, saying, um, including the uh, the American ambassador to Iraq, saying that the election results will not really affect American foreign policy. The congressional results. Another uh, sort of political analyst says, uh, "Well, the president still makes foreign policy, uh, and so that uh, it, it will really still be up to President Bush in the foreign policy realm." Uh, if we want to take the assumption that, that people voted on the election, that members of Congress, I think we also have to at least uh, give some uh, credence to the idea that, that Congress would take, uh, will take a larger role. To be sure, Congress has always taken a secondary role, or at least largely taken a secondary role in foreign policy. And the reality has been that uh, that role has been, over the last six years, pretty modest. Uh, and the reason is that, and this sort of is that it seems to me that party loyalty uh, trumped any kind of institutional loyalty that members might have, uh, even if they had questions uh, about the policy. That, I think, is the first incentive that I would like to share with you about why uh, the new Congress uh, is likely uh, to, to be more activist on the foreign policy realm, because now what you have is that institutional loyalty, that is to make the Congress work, and partisan loyalty reinforce one another. Uh, and that it gives, it seems to me, it gives uh, Democrats uh, a real incentive uh, to take action and to be successful, not in a sort of a punitive 
a punitive way, although certainly some members will, will view it that way, but just simply in terms of doing their job, their constitutional responsibility. Added to that, if you think about it from an institutional perspective, even for Republican members, President Bush is the lamest of lame ducks right now, right? I mean, he's got, he's got two years left, um, a little bit over, and all of these members have presumably career uh, options beyond this two-year uh, two time frame. So that at least gives some incentive to, to Republican members uh, to, to engage in institutional loyalty, that is to do their job, particularly in the oversight area, that they, have, that they seemingly have failed or have failed to do so far. I think there's another imperative of why Congress will be much more activist on, in the foreign policy realm. And that is the re-election re incentive. Those 30 plus new members that got re-elected, and, and plus all of those that had you know, very long nights sweating out the, the, count, the vote count, have real incentives uh, given that, that the nationalization of the war, uh, of, of the war and of foreign policy uh, was the principal factor that, that figured in the votes of so many people uh, is that, that they really need to take uh, need to take some action. And I think it's significant. I think it's it's actually promising in terms of bipartisanship. Frankly, I was surprised when I heard it that one of the, the first phrases out of uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, mouth after the election was that she wanted partnership, not partisanship. And I think that that's a, that's a very positive sign in terms of um, um, making, uh, making the the, the system work. This re-election incentive too, one of the claims of the Democrats of course has been that that uh, Congress has been do nothing, uh, do nothing Congress. And that's even also it seems to me uh, eventually in terms of re-election incentive for why Congress should be uh, should be an activist, take an activist kind of role. A third in keeping with the same pattern of policy and uh, of, of incentives for why Congress uh, should uh, and will play a larger role it seems to me in the foreign policy arena is in the policy area. Um, foreign policy matters, as I've said three or four times already in my short time here. Uh, but also, foreign, the, the Congress, uh, I don't know how many people are aware of it, has actually funded the Iraq Study Group, uh, of, uh, led by James Baker, former Secretary of State, uh, to the first Bush administration, and Lee Hamilton, a long-time uh, congressman from Indiana. And the Congress has a real stake in this, in this study group and its outcomes, and, and they're going to be issuing their report within the next, they said after the election, so stay tuned any time now. And that seems to me will be the, the kind of pivot, it seems to me, for the Congress to play a role in, in future foreign policy and particularly on the Iraq question. An interesting sidelight, or maybe it's not a sidelight, is that Robert Gates is one of the members on the Iraq study group. It's, it's a um, a group composed of ten, uh, 10 people, five Democrats and five Republicans. So there clearly is, it seems to me, also a link there. <laughs> Presumably Gates knows at least the, the, the discussions that have taken place, uh, whether the re final report has been written or not. Um, and that, again, is a policy incentive for the Congress to step up to the plate in, in the foreign policy arena. The obstacles or problems uh, to um, to this kind of uh, congressional uh, involvement and cooperation is that we have a whole spate of new committee chairs. I won't go through all of them, but let me just give you, uh, um, and, and, and some of them I think, and, and this will be an interesting, um, an interesting challenge for both Speaker Pelosi and, and uh, Majority Leader Reid to see how far they want to go on a, co on a cooperative approach or whether they want a more confrontational approach. Because some of these committee chairs, it seems to me, might be ready for uh, more, a more confrontational approach. Joe Biden is now going to be um, chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and some of you may know he was out here a couple weeks ago uh, to give a talk about and, and really focused on the bipartisan theme. And so I, I would see him as embracing some of the things that I said earlier about trying to make Congress a player and make, uh, make uh, uh, Congress have a real impact on policy. 
At Armed Services, Carl Levin is going to move into the, the committee chairmanship. He's a senator from, from, from Michigan. Um, just uh, as sort of one of the mo recent pieces of legislation this past summer, he was one of the people that had a proposal that uh, received uh, some votes in the Senate for withdrawing American forces. Uh, he co-sponsored a piece of legislation withdrawing American forces uh, from, uh, from Iraq. Senator Lieberman, independent Senator Lieberman, uh, if, if past form holds and his seniority is retained, he would become chair of the Home, Homeland Security uh, Committee uh, in the Senate. And it would be interesting to see again, again what, uh, what kind of outcome he would take in terms of the foreign policy arena. Jay Rockefeller moves from being the ranking member on the Intelligence Committee to now chairing that committee. And that also, he's been one, and he's been at odds, frankly, on some issues with the chair, the present chair of the committee, Pat Roberts of Kansas. And it'll be interesting to see how, how he takes, how he, he moves the committee in a different direction. Finally in the Senate, Bobby Byrd will be now chair of the Appropriations Committee. And he's, over the years, he's got a history of really being very contentious with the, uh, admin any administration over foreign policy because he immediately gets out um, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution and start read starts reading it to his colleagues about the powers of, of Congress in the foreign policy realm. So it'll be an interesting, uh, interesting uh, uh, few months or, or years here. Um, in the House side, just a couple people. Uh, Tom Lantos um, from California, a very outspoken uh, representative, particularly in the human rights area, and, and, and uh, will now chair the House International Relations Committee. Um, and it will be interesting when issues such as wiretapping come up. Um, you know what what his position would be. I think have a considerably different position than than um, the, than the present uh, than the present Congress. Um, the same holds true on the intel the head of the Intelligence Select Committee on Intelligence in the House. Um, it will be Jane Harmon from California, who uh, I think also will be will have a much more jauntous and skeptical view uh, of the uh, of the administration's uh, work in, in in this area. So some new chair, uh, chairs of committees that will, I think, be in probably in a more combative and contentious mood than we've seen so far, and also some issues like renewal of trade promotion authority, uh, Kyoto, I've mentioned several times, wiretapping, this whole issue of, of uh, um, um, what, how to treat um, enemy combatants, to put it more generically here. I think these will be some of the issues that could, at least at first blush, uh, challenge this, this uh, seeming in desire to have a cooperative relationship between Congress and the executive. Okay, thank you, Professor McCormick. And now we have Dr. Richard Monsbach, who will talk about the impact of the election on international Well, sort of. Uh, and politics is passion, and I haven't been this happy since August 8, 1974. I don't know how many of you remember that. That was the day Richard Nixon resigned, and it was also my anniversary. Um, I broke open a bottle of champagne then, and I did shortly before coming here this evening. Um, <laughs> I am absolutely persuaded that historians will, in fact, treat this administration with grace. Uh, they have done wonders for the reputation of Warren G. Harding, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Franz Werfel's wonderful uh, play, Jakubowski and the Colonel. It was written uh, during World War II, and it involves the flight uh, of a, uh, an anti-Semitic Polish colonel and a Polish Jew from Poland sort of days ahead of the Nazis. And my analogy here is, is with the Baker Commission and, and what the Baker Commission is being asked to do. Um, in their flight, uh, the Polish colonel says to the little fellow who's accompanying him, be quiet, you know, you're just, a, you're just a little Jew. I'm a Polish colonel. It's my job to handle strategy. You handle tactics. Uh, and this flight continues until finally they find themselves cornered in, in a small tavern in southern France, uh, at which point Jakubowski turns to the colonel and he says, Colonel, okay, uh, Colonel, what's the strategy? And the colonel thinks for a moment and the colonel says, we escape. 
Jakubowski, what are the tactics? That's what the Baker Commission is being asked to do now. What are the tactics? Um, the war in Iraq was lost from day one. Um, there was no clear goal, there was no clear strategy, there was no clear exit, sense of exit. Other than that, uh, they did fairly well. Uh, to paraphrase Churchill, it was a disaster wrapped in a catastrophe uh, from the beginning. And as this election showed, Lincoln was right. You can, feel, you can fool all of the people some of the time, and some of the people all of the time, but thank God you can't fool all of the people all of the time. The emperor, when he got up to give his uh, uh, press address, uh, had absolutely no clothes. It was absolutely obscene. He was naked, he was bare, dash, dash, dash. Um, it really was embarrassing. Um, we now know what the administration's 10-stage plan for victory was. We didn't know at the time. Step one, first you alienate the rest of the world, especially your allies. Step two, secondly, you make certain that you have inadequate military force uh, and you declare victory as quickly as possible, um, but of course you haven't won. Step three, uh, you eliminate the only factor that's holding the pseudo-state of Iraq together. Uh, however uh, venomous Saddam may have been, um, I hypothesize that he's going to come out of jail with a beard on and he will uh, have seen the light, he will be an evangelical Christian and he will once again be asked to take power. Um, step four, you create a sectarian Shiite government uh, that's beholden increasingly to Iran, having already uh, uh, alienated uh, the Sunni minority uh, that was in power initially. Um, step six, a voila, you have created a civil war. It's wonderful. It's not easy to create a civil war, but you've just created it. Uh, how artful. Step seven, you fail utterly to reconstruct what you have destroyed. Uh, you, in effect, uh, make certain that reconstruction doesn't work by making sure that all contracts are funneled through, uh, bless his soul, Donald Rumsfeld's office, uh, the criteria being did you contribute to the Republican National Committee, not whether you know anything about reconstruction. There's the famous story that some of you are aware of of the young man who was in charge of the electrification of the grid in Baghdad who spent half his time filling out law school applications. Um, step eight, you make certain to create a vacuum to give all kinds of experience to new generations of jihadists. Okay? Uh, the president was of course wrong when he and his Secretary of Defense argued there was a connection between Saddam and Al-Qaeda but he created the connection. Uh, you have created a failed state. Step nine, you take on Iran at your moment of greatest weakness. Step ten, finally after you discovered that you in fact had no reason to go in in the first place, there was no WMD, there was not a chance for installing democracy and there is no chance, then you throw in the towel thereby providing evidence that you were A, wrong, B, incompetent, C, had failed utterly, and thereby abetting the very adversaries that you sought to combat in the first place. Uh, when you should have been fighting economically, ideologically, and militarily, uh, someone else from the very beginning. Ergo, we now confront a situation in which the issue is not only Iraq, the issue, more importantly, is Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan is endangered. The military effort in Afghanistan, the reconstruction effort in Afghanistan have been essentially starved for funds and talent to feed the giant insatiable maw uh, in Iraq. Um, then you bring in Robert uh, Gates, uh, a man under I had the pleasure of working under for two years in the early 1980s. A classic realist, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, a power theorist who I imagine, on the basis of his philosophy, would never have gotten engaged in the first place. Um, well, what are the implications? The implications are you now confront crises with Iran, Afghanistan, Korea, while you have a military that's melting in front of your very eyes, and a virtual rebellion on the part of the highest ranking military officers in this country. Um, 
Gates has no answer, but I would I would wager that one of the reasons he was he was placed in power uh, was precisely because he's a member of the commission. And Mr. Baker, who is no uh, stranger to the ways of Washington, uh, was going to make certain before the report was released that the report would be adopted. And uh, clearly understood that Mr. Rumsfeld, who as many of you know is among the best minds of the 13th century, uh, would uh, automatically routinely oppose uh, any effort to intrude on his authority. Is there an answer? Sadly, no. Uh, do the Democrats have an answer? Sadly, no. Uh, the Democrats will indeed, in my judgment, uh, look carefully at the report of the commission and will nod obediently. And the reason that there's no good plan for peace, as Nixon put it uh, uh, when he was elected in 1968, is that in fact it's a situation uh, that uh, offers the choice of bad, worse, and forgive my grammar, worsest. All right? uh, there is no good way out. Um, and so the question is, what do you wish to optimize, maximize? Do you wish to minimize the chaos that you have in the Middle East? Uh, you may recall, do any of you recall that the, we were promised the Iraqi operation would be a precedent uh, for the entire Middle East and that it would, of course, for, in some magical way, resolve the Israeli-Palestinian issue? I, I don't think I need to comment too much on that, except I think that the Iraqi operation has poisoned uh, American foreign relations um, for the foreseeable future. And I'll just leave it at that. I'm sure some of these will come up in question period. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim, do you have any other comments? Okay. We're going to open it up to questions right now and uh, take the mic and direct your question either at uh, all the panelists or one or two or whatever. Who, whoever knows. Uh -huh. are, 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 are there any leaks from the Baker Committee that uh, we have any idea what they're going to propose? I think we heard one. Well, I think um, Chairman Baker did say in, in one interview, in a couple interviews actually, that uh, that he opposed the sort of tripartite solution dividing Iraq into three uh, sectors. He thought that that was a non-starter. I don't know. I mean, that's certainly Joe Biden's favorite plan right at the moment, you know, I mean, along with Les Gelb. Um, so I think that has that has certainly been one leak. The other is that they're considering all options and just, maybe I will respond to Dick. I mean, they really do want to get a consensus kind of view and I, I have no doubt that they're sort of vetting it you know behind the scenes but I think it's vetting it also with Congress because Congress put up the money they put up 1.3 million dollars for this study group you know so they have responsibilities so uh, I don't think they're going to get caught out of the action. No no I certainly didn't mean to imply they were in fact the other rumor that I heard and it's pure rumor is that uh, the Baker people were going to suggest one last effort whatever that means uh, and if that didn't work, then uh, withdrawal, graduated withdrawal. I don't know what one last effort means, though. That was the only question. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Michael Gillespie with Washington Report. Uh, what say? I'm going to try to, I guess, break a little new ground here. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the statement. Could, could you just speak up a little bit? I'm I said I'm going to try to break new ground here, I think. I really enjoyed the statements, but I didn't hear the term neoconservative mentioned in either of them, uh, which is, uh, uh, well, I just, I just like to pose the question. Uh, I think, I think that the, uh, that many people see the, uh, the recent election uh, the, ter the uh, results of the re recent election as a resounding defeat for the neoconservative agenda in the Middle East, uh, which is a, a big part of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and I'm wondering uh, if either of you gentlemen uh, would have a comment about that. Uh, I, I actually was alluding to it when I described Robert Gates as a realist. Okay, which was my way of saying he is not a neocon. Um, one of the bright spots of the second administration, albeit it was very slow in doing it, was 
uh, Condoleezza Rice's adept handling of some of the bureaucratic issues involved with the neocons. Um, she managed initially to get rid of Kick Paul Wolfowitz upstairs to the World Bank where he was seen as being able to do less damage. Um, she then, of course, managed to, despite all the rhetoric, managed to isolate the ever-lovable John Bolton uh, to New York where he couldn't make policy. He could make enemies, but not policy. Uh, and so in, it, it seems to me that gradually, but perhaps too gradually, the neocon influence has been fading. With, with, with Rumsfeld's departure, uh, I don't know, does that leave only Dick Cheney? The, the, the failure of the neocon policy, I think, is even more visible, not so much in Iraq, uh, well, perhaps as much as in Iraq, but, but in general in the Middle East. Um, you know, if, if you ever were able to install elections, and I don't say democracy, I say elections, in uh, the major states in the Middle East, uh, those elections would be devastating for American interests. Uh, something that a realist like, I think, Gates recognizes. Would largely, I would largely agree with what Dick said. I mean, what what um, has been done is that the the office of the Secretary of Defense, where the neocons have been sort of accumulated, and then they had a natural ally uh, in the White House in in terms of the Vice President. That those offices have been gone. Aside from Wolfowitz, Fife is gone as well, and this has been gone for a couple of years. I think, um, and I just would add that it, the Condoleezza Rice and Gates, it seems to me, not only did they work together on the National Security Council in the first Bush administration, but I think they share a worldview in terms of realism and also in terms of a focus on great powers. I think, Dick, you can correct me on this, but but uh, Gates is particularly interested in, in Russian policy, and, and so that, again, that's not what would be unexpected for a realist, but I think uh, um, that that um, that sort of makes the point that there aren't, aren't very many any very many allies left for the neocons. The other the other thing though about the neocons is the social engineering kind of program, and that in some ways it's kind of um, remarkable that the, the neoconservatives. One of the real assumptions of it that they would really like to engage in social engineering, and such a bad job was done of it in terms of the post uh, uh, post. Iraq situation, so that's kind of, there's a certain irony there. Yeah, both, both of them, both Condoleezza Rice and, uh, and Gates are so, were Soviet specialists, uh, and both are very conscious. In fact, there's a fascinating piece, if you ever get a chance to read it, by Rice that she wrote and published in Foreign Affairs shortly before the Bush administration took office, in which, which was entitled, paradoxically, A Realist Foreign Policy, which, of course, they never followed. How would you comment on rather positive attitudes among uh, Europeans after the outcome of the elections? Could you repeat that? Yeah, how would you comment of the, uh, on the reactions, I mean positive reactions among Europeans after the outcome of elections? Well, I mean, I think there's a visceral dislike of Bush among the Europeans. I mean, you know, in terms of whatever the message is, it's really the messenger that they, at least my my experience, they obviously don't like some of the messages coming out of the United States. But it gets amplified, and it's a really a microphone when the, when President Bush, you know, that I, I mean, I think that here is where personality really makes a difference. I was really struck by it in terms of talking because, you know, you could talk about policy to them, and they obviously might object, but if you interject the word Bush or something into that discussion, there is this kind of visceral reaction. Um, I guess I'm of two minds about that. I know that sometimes it's very satisfying when that when that's said and people get a real joy out of that, but it, it seems to me that that is that is something that probably the Europeans really should reconsider. I mean, I'll just quote Joe Biden here. I love his one expression about it. and He, he said uh, to the Europeans, they ought to get over it. I only modestly disagree with my good colleague who's sitting to my left. Um, I think it's partly true. Uh, Europeans, or indeed anyone living outside the United States, have precious little understanding of American society uh, and American politics, uh, and have a peculiar preference 
for the old, shall we say, Eastern establishment that used to govern the United States and the kind of very pro-European uh, policies they had. But, but I think one of the one of the difficulties that Europeans are expressing when they attack Bush uh, is acute frustration uh, in Europe's own weakness. Uh, that is Europe's incapacity to have a serious impact on American foreign policy, in part because uh, of their own refusal uh, to uh, carry out their promised military uh, uh, and economic reforms after the first Persian Gulf War. They knew then that if, if in fact Europe was to have a serious impact on American foreign policy, it would of course also have to have uh, a serious military capability uh, of its own. And uh, it was promised, but it was never delivered. So I think what you're seeing is in part just acute frustration in the inability um, to control that great beast across the Atlantic. Um, can you guys comment on, say, the differences in the negotiating strategies between the Clinton administration and the Bush administration with North Korea and Cuba and, I guess, some of our new adversaries in South, South America, and kind of about um, how well does this uh, policy of not talking directly with our adversaries work? Um, that's a terrific question. Uh, first of all, <laughs> okay. uh, um, McCormick says he'll correct me when I get it wrong. Okay. Um, first of all, it's unclear what the Clinton style was. I mean, it, it, it was it, you know, sort of the the Clinton White House was very much uh, crisis to crisis to crisis, and and I'm not sure it really designed a a, a clear. Uh, way of handling matters. I actually prefer the Bush option vis Korea. I mean, I think I think it it matters to have a multilateral conversation with North Korea uh, and involve others who have, in many respects, as much, in some cases, perhaps even more of a stake uh, in the outcome in East Asia uh, with the United States uh, and to spread, as we say, responsibility as well as uh, um, conflict. This is perhaps especially true in the case of North Korea because, in fact, the only country that has serious leverage is, of course, the People's Republic of China. And, and so it becomes rather fruitless um, for the United States uh, to negotiate on its own. My understanding of uh, actually, Condoleezza Rice spoke about this the other day, and my understanding is that the U.S. government has been prepared all along to provide the kinds of security assurances to the North that uh, uh, Mr. Kim has demanded, Kim the son as opposed to Kim the father of the Holy Ghost, uh, and, um, and that I think uh, the kind of economic benefits that the North at least alleges that it wishes uh, I think the government would provide as well. So I don't think I don't think it's a question. As much as, as you gather, I'm not warmly inclined towards the present administration. I don't really think that the present administration is way off base as far as Korea is concerned. As far as uh, Venezuela, in all fairness, uh, with the exception of some misplaced words shortly after the attempted coup against Hugo Chavez, the administration has been fairly uh, patient. You know, I mean. Uh, Again, you don't think, after this discussion of the neocons, that these are people who turn the other cheek. But actually, in large measure, I think they have. Although how long that's going to last, uh, time only uh, can only tell. So I'm not sure, you know, interestingly enough, I'm not sure that there is a style. Um, I think that the Bush administration has been willing to talk to North Korea. I think they would be perfectly willing to talk to Hugo Chavez if there was anything to talk about. I'm not sure that an issue has been posed that requires a conversation. Um, the United States has offered to talk with, with uh, Tehran, uh, and the conditions haven't been terribly difficult. But one of the problems with Iran is that you don't know who you're negotiating with. Um, this is a real problem. I mean, in other words, are you negotiating with um, the cuckoo who is the prime minister, the president? Are you negotiating uh, with the Ayatollahs? Who are you negotiating with? It's very unclear. Um, and so you can't get a straight answer. Are you negotiating with, with uh, a, very sway, a very suave diplomat? Um, uh, is it Larjani? Is that his name? Larjani, who, who, who 
whom you meet in, in Geneva and elsewhere. And unless you know who you're negotiating with, there's not much you can talk about. So, uh, again, much as I am not happy with the administration, I can't really fault them terribly on those matters. Yeah, I think um, uh, it's hard to also pin down exactly what the negotiating style was of, uh, of Clinton, the Clinton administration. Clearly, in terms of their decision-making apparatus, they wanted a much more open uh, set of discussions. You know, Clinton is famously known for wanting to debate, debate all the issues and to see 13 different sides of the issues and so on. But I'm not sure that that really transferred over to a singular negotiating style with, with adversaries. I mean, they really moved away rather strongly from uh, the sort of the assertive multilateralism that Madeleine Albright talked about at the first. And I think it, this is one area where in some ways the Bush administration gets a bad rap on there. And I, I think there's actually, in action, they've been much more multilateral than some of the pronouncements. I mean, that's that's really been the real division. I mean, you see all these, the, they, they let the E3 go ahead with the uh, discussions with the Iranians. They talk, they want to use the six-party talks to, to deal with the, with the North Koreans. But you get at the same time these kind of unilateralist kind of statements from the president himself that gives a different kind of uh, impression in terms of their their actual behavior. And I'm not, sh I mean, I, I agree with Dick on this. I think that, that the multilateral approach to the North Koreans is the one that, that I really favor. I mean, the, the North Koreans are going to use a divide and conquer strategy if they possibly can. And to keep the, the Chinese among the discussion, the people discussing policy, I mean, that's our clear leverage, and you saw it after the UN action, to get the, to get the Chinese on board to really do something with regard to the North Koreans is a sine qua non of having any successful policy, in my view. The one thing I'd add, and I think the one mistake of the Bush administration in these matters is, Jim reminded me when he mentioned the E3, the European 3 negotiating with the Iranians, is that it was correctly perceived that this is done only after foot dragging and from a position of weakness. And if you're seen as having been forced to do this, you don't really get credit for what Jim correctly says is, is a form of multilateralism. Hi, Jonathan Kent. Uh, I'm a senior in physics. I have two questions. Um, do you foresee any possibility that Congress will invoke the War Powers Act? And my second question is, does a Democratic majority uh, signal, uh, going to signal a protectionist uh, trade policy for the United States? Yes. The second uh, question, yes. I'll call. Well, the War Powers Resolution would be hard to... Uh, the problem in terms of invoking the War Powers Resolution with regard to Iraq, I assume that's the reference point, uh, is that the Congress passed a resolution giving this uh, rather, rather open-ended uh, um, time frame for the President to, to conduct policy with regard to, with regard to Iraq. And the other, and so I, I, I'm not certain that they could actually invoke the War Powers Resolution. I'm, I'm not, no more, I'm stronger than that. They cannot invoke the War Powers Resolution unless there were some new sending, sending of forces that would be clearly a departure from what's in line with the, with the resolution. Because you, you'll recall that the War Powers Resolution says that the President can send in troops for up to 60 days unless there's a statutory authorization or a declaration of war. Well, the president's got in his hip pocket, uh, uh, you know, statutory authorization, and has had it for a very long time. Um, on protectionism, yeah, the, the, they'll talk a good game, but Dick, the, the real reality is that the Congress, uh, you know, always cannot bring itself to, to uh, engage in much protectionism. Yeah, but I, th I, I think I, I think that the uh, the WTO talks are dead. At least for the time being. At least, at least until the end of this administration. I don't know what will happen next time. And I think that's what really matters. Um, is it necessary for the United States to maintain three to 500,000 troops in the Persian Gulf area in order to guarantee constant supply of oil for Europe, Japan, China, the U.S., and to maintain not hegemony, but political control of the nations in the area like Egypt and so on. 
I'll let Nick take that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. It's a great question. I, I, I th it's a good question. I think the question, of course, has its own answer. Uh, and I think the questioner knows what answer he wants. Um, the answer is, of course, in part, as long as this country, as well as Europe uh, and Japan, are as dependent on Middle East oil, let themselves be as dependent as it were, uh, it becomes a serious security concern. Um, I think we have what some of you would know is, of course, a, a, a collective goods issue here. Um, it's true the United States bears a disproportionate burden for protecting the, as it were, the oil to Japan and, and, and Europe. Um, and, but that's explained uh, by collective goods theory. In other words, this is, this is the great power. Nobody else, nobody else uh, probably could do it on their own, and nobody else sees the need to do it as long as the United States is willing to do it. And, and uh, it's hard to imagine uh, how we would withdraw from the region. Now, your question is, do we need three to 500,000? Well, you know, I don't think so. Um, although, oddly enough, the, the security problems of the region are greater now after the intervention in Iraq, in my judgment, than they were before. And so, in a real sense, I think I could argue with you that owing to uh, mistake piled on mistake piled on mistake, the dangers are such that, in fact, uh, um, the U.S. security commitment to certain vital areas in the region are greater now than they were in, in, 2000, in March 2003. Yeah, I just would add, I, I'd be interested to see what the European reaction to even suggestion of too much, down, too much downsizing uh, of, of American presence, I mean, in terms of the oil flow. I mean, again, I don't, you're well aware of this, but the dependency of the Europeans on Middle Eastern oil uh, cer certainly surpasses ours. We're, you know, if we're at the 40, 42 to 45 percent level, you know, I mean, they're, you know, pick your country in Western Europe, uh, particularly, and they're at the 70 percent level. Interestingly enough, one other country that you didn't mention that has a significant concern is China. Uh, the United States Navy is protecting oil to China. This is one of the reasons why, of course, China, whose economy is, is growing faster than that of any other major economy in the world, and whose consumption of uh, energy is growing faster than any other major uh, country in the world, is desperately uh, hawking about for oil from wherever it can get it, uh, including some of the most uh, despicable. Uh, why oil is located where it's located, he only knows, or she only knows, I don't know. But uh, uh, it, it's nevertheless the case that in areas such as the Sudan, uh, they have oil. And, and the Chinese are willing to cozy up to the, you know, the worst of the brutes. I mean, we're only the some of the lesser brutes, but, but the really nasties uh, the Chinese are cozying up to for oil. One of the questions that I, I uh, was sitting here listening to, or I formed a number of questions as I was listening to what you were saying here that I'm not going to ask, but of which one of those was, I was wondering what Professor Monsbach really thought about Don Rumsfeld. But uh, what, uh, the question I had, the other week, last week, two weeks ago, Joe Biden was here. He had a plan for Iraq. Martha has a plan for Iraq. Almost every Democrat running for Congress had a plan for Iraq. What my question is, are the Democrats going to ever be able to come together on any kind of policy? And if so, who those leaders might be? Well, I think you're a little unfair with the question. I mean, I mean, this, what I tried to express was that when you're given a hopeless situation, when the hangman's noose is around your neck, uh, created by somebody else, it's kind of hard to come up with a plan. All right, I mean, I, I don't know that there is a plan that would work. And I say that in a completely nonpartisan way. I mean, I can, I have my own ideas. Uh, as for the tripartite division, I know, actually Jim and I have chatted about that. Uh, I don't know whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, my own sense is that that's what's happening anyway. Okay? That it really doesn't matter. And that uh, at the moment, the only uh, force that's even Remotely keeping Iraq, Iraq, which was a pseudo-state if you go back to 1921, formed among three factions uh, that we all knew about back then, but somehow the U.S. government had to rediscover, uh, Kurds, Shia, Sunni, etc., um, literally have only been held together since 1921 by despotism. I mean, you may loathe Saddam Hussein, but Saddam Hussein was the reason that Iraq survived 
as long as it did. Saddam Hussein and the monarchical uh, predecessors, the, the kings that preceded him. Um, so I think it's in a de facto sense, um, you're already getting that tripart division. And I'm not entirely, this is, I know Jim disagrees with me on this, I'm not entirely sure that you couldn't come up with some idea in which you stationed the equivalent of a rapid uh, a deployment force uh, in Kuwait or somewhere nearby with its eye largely on the province of Anbar uh, and the prospect that that particular region would fall prey, it already is, uh, to, to what we would call uh, the Osama bin Laden of, of this world, and with, with obviously retaining the right to uh, intrude when appropriate. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that I can think of anything better, uh, and I'm not sure, I, I feel fairly certain that if, there, if the United States moves out, that deterioration, that failed state or statelets, uh, wouldn't just occur more quickly. The only question is, do we want to go through the agony of the old Chinese drip, drip, drip torture and see how long you can keep it together? My own judgment is that third parties, whether they're the United Nations or the United States or whomever, should not get caught in civil wars. Because you get shot out, usually only from two directions. In this case, probably the prospect is three or four. Yeah, my concern about this tripartite plan is that it opens up Iraq to really being divided among the states uh, on its borders. And more immediately, of course, what it does for Iran in terms of finally winning the Iran-Iraq War uh, of, you know, 1988, by ended, supposedly ended in 1988. And it, it opens up uh, other, uh, you know, other states that, that might want to divide up territory in there. And I don't see uh, a sufficiently strong, I mean, part of the plan is to have also a, a central government. I, I just don't think, I don't, I don't see this as, as a Bosnia situation where you can have a strong enough force. And, you know, the, the Dayton uh, plan was for maybe up to two years, remember that uh, suggestion of keeping forces in, uh, uh, in Bosnia as part of the Dayton plan? Well, you know, that was... 11 years ago or so. Well, but I think, I think that Jim doesn't know it, but I think he's agreeing with me in an odd way, because if you can't keep forces there, uh, and you leave, you're effectively uh, partitioning I Iraq. And I, I'll tell you what, now this is a guess, there's no good outcome. I, I can't have to say that, but my own sense of the matter is that uh, one of the sources of Iranian influence over Iraqi Shia is the presence of Americans. Okay? And I think that, in fact, we have a fair, we have some evidence that one of the things that animates uh, um, uh, uh, unity, for example, in the Iraqi Shia movement, uh, of which most are not are anti-Iranian. Okay, they're mainly Arabs. Only the the what is it the the Shiri, I think it is the Oskiri, is a known kind of Iranian front group. They spent a lot of time in in Tehran. Uh, my own sense is if the Americans got out, one of the things you'd have to, would have to happen would be uh, a mini form of civil strife within the Shia community itself. And my guess is that at least there's a reasonable prospect that those who would triumph would be, quote, Iraqis in the, in, in, in the national sense of that word, uh, who have no interest, Arabs, who have no interest in uh, Persian uh, control. Uh, I, I hold to what I said earlier. They're going to listen to what uh, uh, the Baker. Baker Commission says, and they're going to nod sagely. Yep. Next question. I have about three things I'd like to ask or discuss. One's a short question, one's an observation, and then one's a recommendation Speak of what I think people should read. Um, my name is Jerry Pierce, and I'm the historian and co-chair for International Relations for the National State Teachers of the Year. For the what? What is it? I'm Jerry Pierce, and I'm the historian and co-chair for International Relations for the National State Teachers of the Year. And my question is, last week somebody told me, and I don't know if this is true, maybe you can answer this, that somebody told me George Bush had never traveled outside of the United States before he was elected president. Do you know if that's true or not? He traveled to Mexico. He traveled to Mexico. That was his sole foreign travel. Okay. I don't know. Any travel. He also regarded, I think, Arizona as. So. <laughs> well, anyway, I've taught school in Russia, the Czech Republic, the Ukraine, Guam, and Taiwan, and I was in the Ukraine teaching when George Bush went into Iraq. 
it was the most uncomfortable experience I've ever had as an American because they kept asking me why and I had no answer. And my observation is, I'm now wondering, with the change in the political scene in the United States, what advice you might give to the Democrats about what the world might be expecting them to be able to do. Because I think that is going to be a big pitfall because I think the world has an expectation, maybe much higher than what can be accomplished. Well, that's not an easy question, but my own, my own advice would be summarized in three related words, okay? Multilateralism, allies, UN. Okay. And I think you see where I'm going. I understand that. And that would be the syllable on which I put the emphasis, okay? Very heavy. Those, constantly those three sorts of ideas. Yeah, the other, I suppose the only other thing that I might add to that is that other states around the world um, have a great respect for international law and uh, deference to international law and as a guiding. I mean, so, you know, something like the ICC, yes. the International Criminal Court, right. for example, test, um, ban. test ban, you know, but, but these kinds of international, Kyoto, yeah, all of these, these international prescriptions, one thing I've noticed is that that's always... And partly, to go back to Dick's earlier point, it's a function of power, though, <laughs> of why that, why that reference point is made. Well, I agree. Yeah. And I, 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 I can't emphasize too strongly, maybe for political reasons, I grant you. I mean, if I were a Democrat, I would be shoving Kyoto, ICC, all this stuff right down the president's throat, if only for political reasons, because right. I want to win two years reasons, because right. I want to win two years reasons, because right. I want to win two years reasons.